you know, when we think of, of, of figs, you know, we usually have an idea in our minds of, of like, you know, what we've seen in, as house plants like Ficus benjamina or even sometimes the, you know, the legendary tropical banyans, the giant, giant figs, or the ones that we eat, the Mediterranean figs, but there, it's a, it's a genus that has just an incredible diversity of forms and uh, everything from almost behaving like an herbaceous plant to you know being some of the largest trees you know in the world and uh, so i want to show you some of those contrasting forms and they're masters of being what are called hemiepiphytes some of them that where they can actually germinate high up in a tree and grow roots down and then and then eventually sometimes engulf the tree that they're in and be able to survive in that very droughty environment and I'd like to talk about also another group of plants only found in the Americas, the genus Clusia, which also does that in a very other unique way. So, and I want to compare and contrast and just how these plants are able to, able to survive in challenging conditions and do some things that, other, that no other plants in the world can do, so. I want to share a personal story about Soltech Solutions Grow Lights. It is the grow light of choice that I've used for the last almost 10 years. So it was probably about 2013 or 2014 when Chris, one of the founders, had reached out to me. And I believe they were just making these grow lights as a project or as an experiment within university. And they wanted me to test one of their grow lights. Prior to Soltech, there weren't any well-performing, good-looking, easy on the eyes grow lights that you could buy. So I was pretty eager to test them out and I haven't looked back since. <laughs> I mean, I've been using them for 10 years. So they first started with their aspect lights and I have three of them in my Brooklyn apartment and I don't know where I would be without them, literally, and I don't know where my <laughs> plants would be without them because now that I'm traveling a lot more, I have all my aspect lights on timers, so they turn on and off without fail, unless the electricity's out, <laughs> but like they really turn on and off without fail when I'm away so I know that my plants are getting light so that they could photosynthesize. And they're full spectrum LED lights, they're, and they're really high quality, very well made. In fact, when Chris and his partners started to grow their company, they moved to my home state of Pennsylvania, and that's where they do all their research, design, development, and also manufacturing. So this is a really awesome product. Um, this is their Vita light, I should say. This is their grow bulb. So they developed this, uh, I think two or three years ago. And again, such a game changer because they started with the aspect light and then they had the track lights, which I actually don't have in my place, but I've seen them in many of the other plant lovers homes. And then of course the grow bulb so that you could put that in any kind of regular lamp. And ah, I can't say enough about them. It's just really a wonderful high quality light, a great investment. And if you wanna use my code, you could also do that. It's homestead2023, and you could check them out at soultech.com. And when you're supporting the light, you're also supporting the community where they do all that research, design, and manufacturing as well. And that is also really meaningful. All right, guys, I'll see you in this episode. So that's what's brought them to become some of the plants that fascinate me the most and fascinate many others. But this is a, this is a, a fig that many would not uh, recognize as a fig right away because it looks more like, like it might be a gesneriid or, or something else. That's, uh, this is Ficus sagittata from Borneo and other areas in Southeast Asia. And it lives as a vine. It doesn't get very, it gets a little bit woody like a liana, but it's, uh, and, and it will hug what it's, what it's growing on very tightly and has roots that will even, even attach to this dry limestone. Mm. So it will even grow above where this gets irrigated and where it's quite, quite dry with oh, just quite fuzzy. crevices. Yes, indeed. It's got a lot of hairs on the stem. And the new leaves are this beautiful red color. And when it reaches the top, it starts to grow horizontally and eventually it will start to produce figs. 
So, which is kind of like what English ivy does in the, in the temperate zone. And where, and where did you it say has this a, is originally from? This one is from Borneo and other areas in tropical Southeast Asia. So. It feels very Mediterranean though, in a way. <laughs> I don't know why, maybe it's just because it's growing on limestone and it looks... It's surprisingly good at growing on this fairly droughty surface. So, you know, we would predict from the areas where it grows in those rainforests in Borneo that, that it might be very... Many climbing plants in the, tro in the wet tropics, they don't want to grow where it gets dry for a long time, but sometimes they they do unexpectedly, and the only way to find out in many cases is to ask the plant by growing it in some challenging condition like this. Well, so. it seems extremely prolific, and it looks lovely buttressed a, up against this it's wall. It's a beautiful gate. plant, and when it was first, uh, we first got this from our colleagues at the Amazon Spheres, and they were growing it as a terrarium plant. And, uh, and when we've tested it under these more outdoor challenging conditions. And this, this even looks untouched by the recent cold spell we had where it was in the yeah. 40s for several days. And uh, so it's got one of the roles that botanic gardens like this can play is to test plants for their utility in horticulture under different conditions. And so we've been propagating and, and putting this in our plant sales so that people can grow them in their What's in the best way yards. to um, propagate this, like a tip cutting or? Tip cuttings are perfect, and uh, it roots extremely easily. And many of them, many of these these branches already have have roots forming. And this one doesn't quite yet because we're kind of in a dry period, so they aren't making as many. But if we peeled this off, it would already have have roots hmm. at each of the nodes because it's very well attached. You mm -hmm. could feel it. It takes some effort to pull it off, and we can pull off just the tip here so we can see oh, yeah. see yeah. some of these are the, the little roots that it forms on a really dry surface mm -hmm. you can see some of them left behind there because yeah. they actually create some sort of adhesive to keep it attached to the surface and so basically you could take that as a cutting and put it in in just some potting soil in a pot and a ziploc bag over it and give it a week or two and it would be growing roots and and you get 100% success. Wow, guaranteed by yep, Chad Husby. That's right, so I, will, I, will, I will vouch for this one. We've really tried it under many conditions and you can see the little roots there even when it's fairly dry that are already formed. So if you can find a cutting that already has roots, you're, you're ready to go. You're good to go. Seems just like a heterohelix in that case, you know what I mean? Like those yeah, IVs so. seem to grapple and easy to divide. And it is interesting how plants that are, you know, otherwise very, you know, totally unrelated, given similar challenges, you know, evolve similar adaptations. Absolutely. So. Is this another one right behind you? Or which one is this? This is actually, it looks, it looks a lot like a fig, but yeah, it's I actually, it yeah, Terea thorsiana from, from Mauritius. It's okay. A, in a whole different family, but it looks very fig-like, and it's even when it's juvenile, it's got uh, its leaves look like kind of a mini glossy oak leaf, and you can see a little bit of the lobing here on on these at the, at the tip. Well, that's I didn't a, mean to take you off your train of thought, no, no, but I did no, think that a, was a ficus when I was that's a favorite, blinking my eye a behind favorite you. plant. <laughs> And right behind it is actually a plant that looks like a, that's breadfruit, actually, oh, which breadfruit. is yeah. in the same family as ficus. You could sometimes find that as a house plant. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's very common, and I don't know how it well it does indoors. I've never grown it indoors, but I have seen it on occasion in houseplant stores. It's worth, it's worth trying. There are, there are several hundred cultivars of breadfruits, and, and they're growing many of them at the National Tropical Botanic Garden in Hawaii, but... They've got breadfruit that will bear fruits at all different times of year. So if you plant the right group of cultivars, you could, would never run out of breadfruit, which is fantastic. And they have, they have the, the latex-like figs. And uh, another interesting thing is that their leaves are, are like Velcro. If you, they'll stick to your clothes. Well, this ficus velosa is a lot larger yeah. than mine at home. <laughs> Tell us yeah. about this one. Yeah, this is another remarkable vining fig from Southeast Asia. and. Um, it's villosa refers to the, the, the hairy leaves, the, the long villose hairs on them. 
and um, which often can makes people f not realize this is a fig. It looks mm. once again more like some sort of something like a gesnariad or maybe even a piper. But, uh, but it w if this, this one, even despite the fact that it tends to grow in really wet rainforest type conditions and grow up wet tree trunks, will also grow up this dry limestone that seldom gets rain and even grow all the way up to the railings above. So it's, it's proven to be quite adaptable and it also makes a good terrarium plant. Oh, it's very cardboardy in this. It's when very... they're young, it's much, uh, much thinner feeling. Oh yes, and you can even experience some of that. These lower leaves yeah. are much thinner and more yeah. flexible where they get more irrigation. Super adaptable. Where do the fruits actually come? Underneath the leaf where it's shingling? They'll or? actually form when it gets higher up and, and they do, yeah, basically right at the nodes where the leaves come out, they will mm. make, make figs. But we haven't had, we've had some, they will actually also produce the, the mature kind of horizontal growth that grows off the, the whatever its support is. And uh, though we don't have any doing that entirely, it may, may start to do it up above here. So. And then this is a, a fig that does another very strange growth habit for, for figs. And all of these kind of very strange habits of figs are are from the Asian tropics. Uh, in, the, in the Americas, all the figs are, are generally trees and shrubs, but in, in Asia, there are some that do, do other things. Uh, this one is woody, but it actually forms stolons uh, like a strawberry. So the original plant was, it was planted here, and then it's colonized this whole area above. And, it, wow. and this grows in the wild in in Thailand and some surrounding areas and grows on the sides of rivers. So uh, it's often good to have this kind of colonizing, low growing habit so it can, it can you know, if the, if the river floods, it's, got, it's, it's anchoring all over. Yeah. And it tends to only grow up, which is interesting, kind of away from the, the river. It's away got from a great canopy, like the way that it looks from above. It's got very beautiful glossy foliage. And uh, another interesting thing is it's, it's got opposite leaves, huh. which is only a small number of figs in, in Asia have opposite leaves. All the other figs around the world have alternate leaves. So it's, uh, it does some very, very unusual things. And if we can go around to the other side, we can see some of the stolons that, that it produces. All right, so this is where it's, where it's climbed to so far. And it's kind of overhanging the path here. What a great, unusual bedding plant. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. And it can tolerate either, you know, shade or full sun. And here are some of the fresh stolons, these oh, horizontal yeah. stems that actually the leaves are modified so that they're little clasping leaves along here. And then when they root in, they develop the, the big photosynthetic leaves that they normally see. And you can see the roots here. Where it, it, they root all along the stolen. And so this whole clump here is one, one clone. It's a clonal fig. And it's uh, habitats near rivers that can become eroded. And then they root at the tip and form a new, new shoot. And uh, this one this also makes them very easy to propagate because they're, uh, they're kind of designed to root everywhere, which is very convenient for horticulture. Yeah, but these would be like what the tips of those stolons turn yeah. into. Yeah, these, and yeah, because these don't have the, um, the pollinator wasps, so they don't make viable seeds. That's uh, all figs or nearly all figs have, you know, one specific species of wasp that pollinates them. And if they don't have that where they're being grown horticulturally, they won't make viable seeds. So there's only a handful of figs uh, in, you know, cultivation away from their native territories that produce viable seeds. Here in South Florida, there's only about five species of figs that produce seeds. The rest, it's all by cuttings or in this case, stolen seed. Oh, this doesn't look like a fig at all. Yeah, this is another fig that kind of breaks breaks our stereotypes, and um, it's uh, it's actually a, a fig that's a great ground cover, and you know doesn't get very woody either. It's uh, 
Ficus Montana variety purpurescence, and it's, it's also unusual because it has amazing color on the undersides of the leaves, which other than Ficus deltoidea, there's very, there are very few figs that have great leaf color under the leaves. So, so Ficus Montana, does that mean it's on um, mon mountains or higher elevation or? It seems that probably that's where the where one of the species one of the varieties is from is from that it was originally described. But these are certainly from lowland areas and hmm. in Thailand, and they like the heat. And it's actually growing uh, next to the typical ficus montana, which is kind of interesting. It's a little bit interspersed. There's these oak-shaped leaves. Oh yeah, look at that and uh, doesn't have the color, but also is, is fairly prostrate and it kind of gets more, more dense in here. We kind of run out of the purpurescence and end up with the uh, regular ficus montana. I mean, it almost looks like uh, it starts as like a, hmm, like you know how mulberry comes in different leaf shapes or like sassafras and they start to develop these little finger mittens and then as it matures, it gets into this like quercus shape. Oh yeah, yeah. It's got a very plastic leaf shape. Yeah. Whereas this, this, the purple, the purple underside variety just, they, it never develops lobes that I've seen. So. So are those two different species? They're actually two different varieties of the same species. Of the same like, species. Like wow. Montana. Very different. And we have one other interesting variety of that species over here. But this is a, a version of, of Ficus Montana that actually grows more upright <laughs> stems. That is so wacky. Very, very oak-like. Um, but then the other thing it does is that instead of being quite prostrate, it actually produces underground rhizome-like stems and forms huh. a clump. So you can see the new it's shoot so coming here. It's so willowy. The way that it's standing up almost looks as if it, it's like being suspended by like a string from above. And you know that's probably partly due to the fact that its stems are hollow. Huh. So they're very flexible and, and they're, uh, they're, its strategy is not to invest, you know, it, it doesn't get very woody. Once again, it almost behaves like it's an herbaceous plant. All the figs are technically woody, but it's, such, it's a genus with so many adaptations that, you know, it even has, basically wants to behave more like an herb. You know, where, it, where it's even got a hollow stem, which usually means you're not investing a lot in your stems. Mm -hmm. And you're investing more in the whole clone because you're growing rhizomes under, underground. And, uh, and each of these stems will actually produce figs at, at even smaller sizes than this. They'll have little yellow figs all along it where each leaf comes out. Mm -hmm. And the figs do look like, they, they look like Ficus Montana figs, which is how the fig experts decided this is another version of it, though we're not. But we got this at a botanical garden in, in Singapore, and the label said Java on it, so it may, it may be from, from Indonesia. So. There's, a, there's an anole on this I one. I know, so I it's, saw it's these like his little tubby thing. bellies. <laughs> yeah, and this uh, remarkable fig is another demonstration of, of a habit that the that the figs have, have adapted with. And uh, this is Ficus brucei, which was long in cultivation as the lowland form of Ficus damaropsis, the dinner plate fig. And um, it's kind of fascinating because it's got the, the biggest leaves of any fig, yet it, uh, it doesn't become a big tree. It's actually become sort of a large shrub. It won't get a whole lot taller than this, than this is now, maybe 10, 15 feet tall. And it forms multiple branches and never, they never get all that thick. And the, and the stems actually become hollow fairly quickly. Hmm. So it's- They become hollow. They become, yeah, when they're very young, they're solid. And then as they, as they expand, they get, they start to become a bit hollow. And, and in fact, that's one of the keys to propagation with this, with this fig. If you wanna uh, propagate it from cuttings, Taking cuttings from the young shoots that before they become hollow is often the way to do it. Or you can air layers is the other major way that people propagate this. But is there a way that you could tell it's hollow? Like, is it a certain diameter? It's uh, once it starts to get beyond maybe a foot long, it, they tend to start like this. This shoot is starting to become hollow. They I sort of see. start to fatten up fairly, 
fairly quickly. We don't really have any currently, well, we do have a couple of, at least one really young shoot up here. It's just coming out, but they come out fairly thin early. You can kind of see how they start out narrower and then mm -hmm. they expand. But since it's winter, this isn't forming a lot of new shoots. It also, it's known for having a very interesting, these are dried now, but the, the cyconia, the structures, the- Gosh, it looks like a dragon fruit, like that's desiccated. It does, uh, very much so. And um, and so this is like a dragon fruit. It's it's basically a modified stem structure that has has flowers and then inside it and then, and then becomes a fruit, it's a fruiting structure. And, uh, but we don't have the pollinators for this, so it never becomes, they, they basically fall off while the unpollinated and, uh, and then dry up. And, but when these are fresh, they have kind of a reddish look to them. And uh, the contrast with, the, with Ficus dameropsis, its close relative from higher elevations is, is that these are red and kind of, and the tips uh, are free, they, whereas in the dameropsis, it's all green and, they, and they're all tightly, uh, pressed around it in a nice spiral fashion. So. But it's, uh, it's a spectacular fig and, uh, and basically it's got the largest, you know, uh, cyconia or fig, fig producing structures, but, and, and also the largest leaves, but it's not a giant tree, which is quite remarkable. And I should note that there is quite a bit of leaf drop here, but it's also because of that cold spell that we had in Florida here. Yes, it's from a very, this is from the lowlands in New Guinea, which is very hot and tropical. And so it doesn't, doesn't like the cold temperatures very much. So it will drop its leaves, but then once things are warming up in about a, a month or two, they, it will come into full, full of new leaves. Good. That has a lot of figs on it. It sure does, and this is, and these are actually figs that can be eaten. Uh, they look very uh, robust. This is sometimes called the coconut fig or the Roxburgh fig. It used to be called, because it used to be Ficus Roxburghiana, now it's Ficus auriculata, which is, uh, ranges from Southern China into the Asian tropics. And like Ficus dameropsis, it's more of a large rounded shrub rather than becoming a big tree and uh, it, though this doesn't uh, become as hollow as that, it does become a little bit hollow, the stems. And, um, and it's known for its uh, wonderful figs that are produced on the lower stem pretty much continuously all year. And like most figs in cultivation, it doesn't have its pollinator wasp didn't come with it. So the normal uh, versions of this won't ripen. So the figs will just fall off when they're hard, but this is a special, special selection that actually will ripen without being pollinated. Hmm. And the figs are quite tasty. Is this what a ripened one looks like? That's, that's one is just about ripe. Yeah. It should be. This one's even probably a little bit riper mm -hmm. here. And we can take a look and even taste it. So. This one, it has a oh, fairly wow. thick. Look at the pink flesh. Thick outer uh, skin, but then this wonderful pink uh, flesh inside. Wow, that looks very yummy. And it's got a little bit of a strawberry-like flavor, but we'll let you decide yeah. what the uh, Thank you. taste is like. Can you eat the outside of it or is it not? Uh, the outside isn't. It's a little you, hard. Yeah, it's a little hard, so it's better to just kind of eat the inner, inner flesh. Ooh. Mmm. Okay, yeah, definitely strawberry, but with a completely different texture. I mean, just like, it's like a fig texture. Not as sweet as a strawberry. Yeah. Because the wild strawberries are really sweet. I feel like it tastes something else, but I'm not quite sure what it is. But That's strawberry is the closest I think you could get. Delicious. Mm. I'm tasting a lot of new fruits today. Absolutely, it's a, it's a neat one. And it has an interesting uh, backstory because 
uh, David Fairchild, who the garden was named after, it's, he really thought this, this fig species had promise as a fruit for, for South Florida and other areas in the tropics, but the only clone he ever had was one that wouldn't ripen on its own, so he grew that at his home, uh, the Kempong near here, and that, that original tree was killed by a hurricane in 1992, and then the, the person who took over care of his property, Larry Shockman, went on some trips to replace the plants at David Fairchild's home, and he went to Indonesia and brought this back, this clone, which turned out to be one that would ripen without pollination. So, I mean, what a lucky find on that part. Absolutely. So it's the. So what what is in it that makes it ripen without the pollination? How does that happen? That's a bit of a mystery because um, there there's several. There's some, the, the regular edible Mediterranean fig, Ficus carica, has been selected over, you know, through many hundreds of years to where, to the point where it will ripen without pollination by humans, but this is not, this hasn't been treated like that, so it's kind of mysterious. Nobody's really bred this for, for that characteristic, and it just may be that certain individuals have a mutation that allows them to, to continue ripening. Um, something similar happened with the sycamore fig, which is another uh, edible fig from Africa that lost its pollinator when it was grown in uh, the Middle East and in North Africa. But then about 1400 years ago, some sort of mutation occurred that where there's now a variety that will ripen on its own. So. Hmm. Go, fig go figure. Yeah, go figure. <laughs> 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 but it's a figure of speech. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for yeah, that. Sure. That's really exciting. It's, pretty. it's funny how when you layer on like a culinary aspect to it, how it becomes like one of my more favorite species that we've <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we've yes. Found. Yeah. These banyan forms of figs, which this is a great example of, are yeah, they, they basically one tree becomes can become a whole forest, and um, and the, this group, the figs that can do this, that can become banyans, that can where you can you start off with a single trunk. It may even start off you know high in the canopy of another tree where a bird dropped a seed, and then they create these these roots that then thicken into what are effectively new trunks, even though they are anatomically still roots but they function like, like trunks. And so you can have one tree spread out horizontally indefinitely. They've, it's overcome the limitation. Most trees you know, just grow up in height and there's a, there are physical limits to how high a tree can grow. It's, you know, it's about 400 feet or so, like the, giant, the, the, the coast redwoods and a few others, some eucalyptus that get up to that size. But, but uh, you can overcome that by growing horizontally. And, and this, of all trees, it's, it's the banyan figs that have done this most effectively. And, uh, and they, the word banyan comes from in, the in, in Indian term for market. Because in, in India, they, there are you know, trees, individual banyans that, that cover acres. And you can have a whole market under one tree. Unbelievable. So that's the, And so often these, uh, where, they're, where, where they're grown in urban settings, their sizes are controlled by obstacles they run into, like roads and, and whatnot, but they can, they can expand indefinitely. It's quite, quite amazing. This is Ficus altissima, which has to do with how they're called the lofty fig, and it certainly can grow to great heights as well as great breadth. Well, Ficus altissima is one that you could find in the horticultural <laughs> trade, but I don't think you would ever find it growing quite like this indoors. Absolutely. Oh, yes. And it's, it's actually, there's a version of it that's now a popular houseplant, I believe. Yeah, it's, yeah. exactly. And, uh, well, this is the original tree house, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. This one, you could really, you could actually direct their roots even so you could deliberately form walls with these. And, and in fact, these are the, the, young, the young roots. Uh, actually, when they, when they reach the ground, they, they actually become tense, like hmm. a violin string or something. Yeah. And in fact, they do that by developing this, this 
what's called tension wood. Most trees, you know, if they, if they lean to one side and then start growing upwards, that's, they develop tension wood to pull, pull the branches vertical. But the, the figs are the only plants that can develop tension wood all around in, radially in a circle, not just on one side. And in fact, if you let these uh, roots before they hit the ground grow into a pot, once they hit the pot, they will lift the pot in the air because they develop the tension just from whenever they, whenever they, they reach soil. And if you cut these, they will separate and you can't put them back together. What makes them react that way? Is it a, just a physical reaction? Is it a chemical reaction when it hits the soil? You know, I, I don't know, think that's known, even what exactly what the signaling is that, mm -hmm. that causes them to develop the tension. But um, yes, there is some, you know, there's a lot of these uh, signals in plants that cause their transformations to different forms that we don't exactly understand yet. So, so there's a, another genus that's only found in the Americas, whereas ficus is found all over the tropics, that um, Kind of, it fills a, a similar niche to, to many fig trees that where, where it, they grow is what are called hemiapophytes, meaning that they often start life high in a tree where a bird uh, deposits a seed and then it germinates and then grows its roots down and eventually hits the ground and starts to grow much faster once it gets, once it doesn't have to just rely on, on rainfall and not having any soil up high up in the canopy. And that's the, the genus Clusia. And, um, and this is the, the most famous uh, member of the genus, Clusia rosea, which has uh, beautiful big flowers that, that are very, have very shiny petals. It's many, it, like many other uh, species in the genus, they call them porcelain flowers. And this isn't currently in flower, but it is developing the fruits where the flowers used to be and has some of the old petals still clinging to it. All the other members of the genus Clusia have that you need to have both a male and a female specimen to produce seeds to get them to cross-pollinate because they have separate male and female seed and pollen producing flowers on different plants, whereas Clusia rosea can make viable seeds with just a single female. Hmm. They, uh, they produce seeds without pollination, viable seeds and fruits. And so this is the species that's the best colonizer of, uh, of new places, which is why it's all over the Caribbean and probably why it's the only species native to the continental U.S. It just got into the Florida Keys, and, um, and it actually is, is very well adapted to Florida, though it's, it actually turns out to be a little cold sensitive because some of these have dropped a lot of leaves after our recent cold spell, but still have a lot of nice looking intact leaves. This kind of came as a surprise to many people. But um, like the figs, they produce uh, aerial roots, like, like the banyans, and that also thicken up and become woody, mm. like this, these central uh, roots here in the middle. But they, they, they don't tend to be as much of a strangler as the banyans. The banyans, because they can produce that, that tension wood that, that actually tightens up, they can actually eventually basically, you know, what they call strangle the host tree, meaning cut into its bark and then it eventually can't, you know, eventually becomes girdled by the, by the fig and, and will kill the host tree. The clusia don't tend to, they don't have that tension wood and they don't, they don't tend to hug the host tree as much, so they don't tend to be as damaging to them, but they still produce very, very impressive aerial roots and... Um, yeah, these almost seem like the things that the aerial roots that would hang down from your monstera or something, they just kind of, you know, eventually wind up under your dresser or something like that. Oh yes, yes, and they're much more, yeah, they're much more rubbery and yeah. they're much, then they don't produce as, as dense a wood at all as the, as, the, as the figs do. So it is, they are a lot more aer aeroid-like in their texture for sure. And, uh, but, but Clusia rosea is also, uh, has been famous among people who study photosynthesis, mm -hmm. who study and who study plant physiology because it's it's a great representative of this genus as being the only genus of, of truly dicot trees that can switch photosynthesis systems. So Clusia can do the normal C3 photosynthesis, which almost all land plants do from ferns 
up to all the flowering trees. And, but it can also do a very special water conserving sort of photosynthesis called CAM, which is what cacti do use, which where they, where they actually open the, the pores in their leaves at night and take in CO2 at night when they don't lose as much water vapor through their pores, the stomata. And they can store that CO2, the carbon in the CO2 temporarily in these organic acids, one of which is malic acid, which is found in apples and which takes some energy. It takes a little bit of extra energy to store the, the carbon. And then they, but, it, but it's worth it when they're water stressed to conserve water. So they close their stomata, then these little pores during the day when it's hot and sunny, when, and, they, and they then release the carbon in their, in their leaves with the stomata closed so they can then do photosynthesis with that carbon using the sunlight, but not losing water vapor. So it's a great water conservation strategy. And the Clusi are able to do that when their roots haven't hit the ground yet, when they're mm. still growing high in the trees and need to conserve water. And then when they hit the ground, they can use the switch back to CAM photosynthesis, switch back to C3 photosynthesis, which is more efficient when you have uh, good sources, abundant sources of water and don't need to worry about conserving the water as much. So they're incredibly flexible, and that flexibility is found in many Clusia species. And they're so flexible that one branch can be doing, that's growing in the sun, can be doing the more water conservation photosynthesis, the, the CAM, and then another branch that's in a shady spot can be doing C3, which is more efficient in a sh under lower light conditions. And, uh, and they can even, even, they've even done experiments where one leaf in a pair can be coaxed to do to do C3 and the other CAM photosynthesis. So they're the most probably the most flexible trees in terms of their photosynthesis in the whole world, which is wow. quite quite remarkable. And one of the big mysteries about this genus is because it's it's very successful in the American tropics. They're found in all different habitats and the, from high mountains down to lowlands. They're in beaches and in rainforests and dark rainforests and uh, and they're able to succeed in all those habits, but this, this adaptation is still only found in this genus of woody trees, not found in any others. So why it only developed in this, and it's not even found in other genera in its same family, Clusiaceae. So it's a, it's a, it's a really fascinating uh, group of trees for those who like to study how plants grow, called e ecophysiology is the, is the discipline in botany that studies how plants adapt to their to their environment. And, uh, I wonder if there was one that was like an ancient one that was in another area that had the need to be able to go back and forth and that one became extinct. And I don't know, I don't know, I'm just making this stuff up, but yeah. Oh, it may, it may well be that, that, you know, the thing is that with uh, plants, you know, with evolution in general is that so much of it is, is hidden in history that there's some we can infer, you know, sometimes, you know, we, the problem is that we, we're very limited on what we can infer about physiology from fossils. That's why it took so long to even figure out that dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded or were warm-blooded. And um, eventually they could, but with a lot of plants, we, you know, especially plants that evolved more recently, we don't have fossils and, and we can only, you know, kind of test the, hype, the different hypotheses with the living plants and uh, maybe we'll figure it out one day. So. Yeah. And I found a fruit, an open fruit. Oh, look at that. One of the clusias had the, the fruit split open uh, along these, these sutures that make a, often make nice patterns. Yeah. And then the seeds are in these little fleshy, surrounded by this fleshy material, the fruit. So they're, they're quite tiny. They're actually about, they're kind of small, like, like much like uh, fig seeds. Mm. Cool. And many of these uh, clusias also, they secrete uh, a resin in their, in their flowers that, that is very sticky and that is attra attracts certain kinds of bees that, that are also pollinators of, of certain orchids. So um, they make good companion trees for that. Hmm. And, uh, so you could put your orchids right on your clusia. Most definitely. But one of the uh, 
interesting clusias that is fairly widespread, at least in, in South Florida, but also in, in other parts of the country. The problem is that clusia is a, is a very big genus, uh, over 300 species, but um, be, until they flower, it can be very hard for people to distinguish one from another unless you look closely at some of the details. So this one is often in circulation as Clusia rosia nana. And it's actually a whole different species. It's Clusia fluminensis from Brazil that grows often along the beach and the dry forest there. But this was a special small-leafed form of that species that was selected by Roberto Burley Marx, a famous landscape architect from Brazil who mm -hmm. introduced a lot of neat plants. and. Um, and this one grows more as a small shrub and, and produces lots of uh, aerial roots and, and also makes a great pot plant and a great natural bonsai. And they're very, this is one of the aerial roots here because due to the recent cold snap, uh, it's kind of the tip is a bit dried, but it, this will uh, basically one individual, it grows kind of almost like a miniature banyan tree and you can even grow it in a, in a hanging basket. And it rarely flowers so that uh, not many people have seen that it has a very different flower than Clusia rosia. And that's kind of the default species that people usually will name a Clusia when they don't know what species it is. We'll see how succulent it is. Yeah. And cool. the, yeah, the succulence of the leaves is, is part of its, their ability to do that Crassulacean acid metabolism, the CAM photosynthesis because um, they store the carbon in these organic acids like malic acid, which makes apples have their, distinguish, their distinctive kind of acidic taste. And, and they need room to store all those, those compounds with, with carbon. And they need, so all the plants that do cam photosynthesis, like cacti, are very fleshy. They either have fleshy stems or fleshy leaves for storing the, the carbon at night and then using it during the day. So. Um, that's one of the characteristics of these clusias. But yeah, that we've been experimenting with uh, growing a, other species of clusia because it's, it is a fairly, there are between three and 400 species and many undescribed probably. And uh, most, you know, most of them haven't been tried in horticulture and, um, or at least haven't been tried much. And we've been experimenting with a few of them. This is, clu this is the full size clusia fluminensis or at least one version of it, one clone from Brazil and uh, got this from the Huntington Botanic Gardens. And once again, it's got very thick leaves and, uh, and they tend to be very geometric in these nice kind of oval shapes. And the leaves are opposite and, uh, and it gets a nice, nice compact form, very kind of dark, dark green, very shiny. And it's uh, filled in quite nicely yeah, It's here. a beautiful one. And another virtue is that many clusia, most clusias tend to be very easy from cuttings. They tend to root very well, which is kind of like figs. They're kind of designed to produce lots of roots, aerial roots when they're... Geez, I must be rooting it wrong. I, I got a clusia cutting and I got another one and I just could not root it. What's the strategy? Do you, is it a tip cutting? Is it, it can't be woody? Like what's the... Well, uh, you know, it usually what we usually have rooted them under mist here, and oh, they do, they do yeah. they tend to they the they, they will dry humidity. out. <laughs> yeah, they will dry out if you don't. You can, you can also do sometimes with bags over the mm -hmm. over them may may be enough, but they they you know they will dry out if you don't give them some extra humidity. But but once you get the conditions right, they do tend to, but they can be fairly slow to root sometimes. Oh, maybe that a, could be it too where you just like give up and you're like, this will never root. <laughs> <laughs> and depending on if it's, if it's a clusia from lowland conditions, it may want more, you know, more warmth to, to root very well. And, it's, uh, and if it's from, but there are many clusias that are actually from cooler climates, from higher in the mountains, and very few of those have been tried in horticulture. So those would be ones that might even perform better in, in kind of indoor settings and in temperate zones. <laughs> And uh, those don't like Florida conditions. We've tried some of those and they, yeah, they suffer in our heat. So they, not all clusias are created equal. This is one from 
from Costa Rica. This is bizarro looking. That looks totally different than, than the others. And this one actually... The, oh, these, the, yeah, break really easily, huh? I think it's, uh, they've got, they've, the, the cold kind of made them brittle recently, but they, um, these, the, the, the flowers actually don't open up very much on these. They don't, like, some clusias are famous for, for having very large, spectacular, they call them porcelain flowers. And, um, and others have pretty inconspicuous flowers, like this one has a, just an abundance. See, these are closer to maturity here. here you know. The but one that I think open. of Clusia, not only Ros Rosia, but Clu Clusia lanceolata is another one I think that is often in horticulture. Yeah, we do have actually some um, Clusia lanceolata right back here. I think this is... Uh, might actually be might be in bloom now, right? Wouldn't yeah, it, this is this hiding one hiding back here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We do have both males and females. Let's see if we can find any flowers. Huh? Yeah. yeah, they don't last long, like you yeah, said. Yeah, this one is old. Yeah. The Clusia is another um, interesting genus that that has separate male and female plants. So the and in some and in some. Many species, the male and female flowers look very different. And, um, and, and sometimes they've ha ha actually used, used DNA to make sure that plants that they identified as the same species are really so, because the male and female just look so different, they weren't sure if they were actually different species or not, so. Hmm. And, um, and one, one that's also a bit in horticulture, Clusia orthonera, which has a very beautiful pink flower. But that, those are the male flowers that are really pink. The females are, are white petals, and they, and they aren't as much in horticulture. So. And in others, the, you know, whether, which one is more colorful can vary. So it's, uh, they're quite, uh, they have both interest in their kind of vegetative architecture, the, the part that's not reproductive and in the flowers. So is the flower just on this long stalk? Is that how is that how the flower grows, or what is this stalk considered? Yeah, that's that's a you know it's basically a you know it's the supporting branch that the flower is on, and uh, so it's been modified be, okay. so it's so it's sort of the end part would be probably called the peduncle, but you know, mm -hmm. the, that's, that's, a, that's directly attached to the flower, but the rest of it's just sort of a modified branch that. Interesting that the flowers don't really open, like you said, or do they open? They, they open, but not much, you know, okay. like some, there are a number of clusia that won't, you know, get the, the, the petals won't spread open. Okay. Largely, they'll just kind of, they just have a few petals and they'll just open just a little bit. And um, and a number of uh, the many clusias produce resin uh, in their in their flowers that actually attract some of the bees that pollinate orchids, so they make good orchid companions. Um, well, you spoke of resins. I mean, when I think of ficus, I think of like that little latex they have, and it doesn't clusia have something similar? Yeah, clusia has a has a has a latex that actually. Sometimes the, the latex oxidizes to different colors when you cut a branch, and we can do some of that, mm -hmm. and, it, and expose it to air. It, it comes out milky at first, but then in some species it may turn yellow or orange, you know, in a few minutes. And that can actually be a way to rule out or, or establish what species a, a clusia is when you don't have a flower, it can help. You can at least rule out what it's not. And uh, this is... Um, Clusia hilariana from uh, Brazil that grows in, in coastal forests. It's got really nice, very geometric oval leaves and it's got very beautiful flowers that it produces now and then that are, have white petals. And this is a new introduction we're, we're trying. There's many of the, there are many really promising clusias from Brazil. Look at sort of the... Uh, the latex tends to come out sort of clear in some of them. We'll see how this one, I think, oxidizes to a color. But we can check back in a mm -hmm. few minutes, see what it's turning into. And the leaves are 
And this is Clusia wedeliana, also from Brazil, so from the lowlands there, that actually has uh, red flowers, red petal flowers, and becomes sort of a large spreading shrub. It doesn't Are develop these so leaves much tree or light. coming out, or is that a flower? That's oh. actually a branch. That's it's a, a branch young coming shoot out. Okay. coming out. And one of the things growing a diversity of these plants in a botanical garden helps us figure out is how they tolerate stress. This Clusia hameliana uh, really suffered from the cold, yeah. whereas these others didn't even notice it. So this And where is this one originally from? This one's from Trinidad. Oh. And uh, also adjacent parts of South America. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes it's hard to predict because the Brazilian species we were just looking at are from all equally tropical areas. So. Yeah. Confounding. Sometimes you don't know how they're going to react to different stresses until, until you try. And this um, one Clusia that's in some circulation in the US and in Europe, they call it Clusia princess. Hmm. It has these little diamond-shaped leaves. It sometimes goes under that name or under other uh, names. But this, uh, this is actually kind of a mystery. You haven't seen it flower, and I'm not sure what uh, species it is. And often people call it Clusia rosea, which it is certainly not, but, but it's got quite a distinctive leaf. We trust this helped expand your appreciation for both the ficus and Clusia genera. Now, if you enjoy learning about plants on these field trips, then do us a favor and give the video a thumbs up and feel free to comment below. And if you're keen on helping keep this channel ticking, hit that subscribe button and the notifications bell will actually keep you informed on upcoming episodes. Tipping the channel or becoming one of our supportive sustaining members is so much appreciated because it allows us to do more great episodes like this. Additionally, if you want to further your houseplant knowledge, you could check out our online houseplant materials and courses, including the 125 houseplant care spreadsheet, houseplant basics, troubleshoot your houseplants, and the houseplant masterclass. And if you haven't heard, we launched a new channel called Flock Finger Lakes, which covers outdoor gardening, herbs, permaculture, agroforestry, homesteading, and the lost arts. Between Plant One On Me and Flock, we're producing two to four videos per week. So there's much to explore across the two channels. We'll see you in the next episode.